no uh, further delay, let me introduce our last speaker. By the way, I promise you, you're not missing anything. We are a little behind, but there's nothing outside you're missing, so. Um, that's Paul? not true. There's something very important outside that they're missing. Not yet. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. Thanks. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Tim um, and, and Lisa. She hung in there for a while, but I, I got to give her got to give her credit uh, for, for being here. And, and I'm going to be uh, very quick. But what I want to what I want to sort of leave the idea with is, you know, can we harness the the, the type two cell to uh, to help us treat patients with IPF? Okay. So we know about this disease. This is a terrible disease basically scarring, but it's such a peculiar form of scarring. This patient I took care of when I was a fellow passed away within about three months of this CAT scan, but look at large areas of this lung are still relatively uninvolved. So you, there's some great studies, Matt Honey Hockey, Yvonne Rosas, um, David Letterer, looking at early reticulation in patients that have other diseases. Where I practice in uh, in Cedar sinai Hospital, it sits at the edge of Beverly Hills and West Hollywood, we have another approach. Every time you sneeze, you get a CAT scan. So this is what we start to see here. We see these very early changes. And you know, what do we, you know, what do we do with this? We have no idea. This early reticulation, no honeycomb changes. But if you biopsy this, what do you see? So you see some established scar, you see what appears to be fairly normal um, looking interstices, and then in between you have sort of the holy grail. We, you have the, uh, the overlying epithelium, and this thing almost looks like a little tumor. So the questions are, what on the, uh, on the epithelial side, what on the mesenchymal side? So in the next sort of 12 minutes, I'm gonna show you some, some data from our lab and, and try to get you to think about this idea that can we harness the ability of the alveolar type 2 cell to renew itself in much about the ideas you've heard from previous speakers, can we harness that to try to, to come up with an approach for, for IPF? Because it can happen quickly. This is a patient of mine who over three months developed rapidly scarring, needed to go on to get a lung transplant. But is all fibrosis the same? This is a patient of mine, awful looking fibrosis. A lot of traction bronchiectasis here, young woman, scarring, very, very homogeneous, very, very pink. Boom, cured with immunosuppressive therapy. So some established fibrosis can go away. We just haven't been able to get there with IPF. So this is what the lung looks like when you take it out at the time of transplant. This is a really, you're not gonna, you're not gonna um, regenerate this. So you've heard a lot, great talks uh, by everybody, not only in this session, but earlier about this idea about the epithelium, perhaps undergoing senescence and then activation of, of, the, of uh, the fibrosis. My bias is that we really need two approaches. One is to, is to regenerate the, the alveolar type 2 cell, um, as you heard about, and I'll show you some more information. But we also need, need drugs that target the, the fibroblast piece. And it's my bias that both perfenidone and intetinib work sort of on the mesenchymal piece, but we need something that's also going to target the alveolar epithelium. You saw some beautiful work from uh, Tim's group earlier. This is just a patient of mine who uh, went on to get a lung transplant, and this is just evidence of this ER stress pathway getting activated, just you know, sitting on top of this beautiful little fibroblastic focus. So I, was, I became interested in some years ago in sort of, in terms of the homeostasis of the lung, you know, how, how the alveolar space, you know, is exposed to the environment all the time. And, the, and the, uh, the alveolar epithelium needs to sort of be protected in some way. And so we became interested, and this is why I reminded Tall Paul that uh, chitin is a uh, glycosaminoglycan, because hyaluronan, the molecule that I'm interested in, is almost virtually identical. The difference is that chitin is in the carpet, hyaluronin is only inside your body. And if you actually can't make it, if it's genetically deleted in a mouse, you can't develop a heart. So it's essentially um, very, very important in a number of different inflammatory fibrotic processes. And a few years ago, what we showed was that on the type 2 cell in the mouse, that um, the alveolar type 2 cell has um, both these, these, these innate immune receptors, TLR2 and TLR4, and they actually interact with a coat almost. It's like a, it's like a warm blanket, a coat of hyaluronan on the cell surface of the epithelium. And what this we showed some, t some years ago now, what this was protective of an acute lung injury. So sort of what you've heard about in a number of the previous talks, you know, acute lung injury, that if you don't have this interaction, the cells were much more prone 
to undergo apoptosis, um, and, the, and the mice died at a much greater rate. So we began to wonder, could this have a greater role in more chronic fibrosis? So what you, you heard, I'm not going to be nearly as elegant as Tushar, but beautiful data on what normally uh, regulates normal type 2 cell renewal. But why do, why do these type 2 cells have this glycosaminoglycan on the surface, and why do they have an innate immune ligand? TLR4 is thought to generally help us fight off infections. Why does an epithelial cell have this? What are the signals this generates? What are the consequences? And most importantly, does this have anything to do with IPF? Okay, so one of the, one of the, the, um, the good fortunes I've had over the years, because I've been at a bunch of different places, and I've had great colleagues, and Barry Strip really pioneered this ability to go into the lungs of the mouse and purify type 2 cells. And we've been able to, to correlate that what he's, his, his, um, this flow sorting strategy based on these markers here, that if you actually do it from the stand, also do it with lineage label, that we are actually able to purify from the mouse type 2 cells without culturing them. So flow sorting them. They don't have to see plastic where all sorts of bad things happen. So this is how we take out these cells in the mouse. The other piece of data you need to know is after the BLEO model, the type 2 cells, this is a, just a simple physiologic time course. The type 2 cells are depleted and they re regenerate. So this is sort of our assay, if you will, for regeneration. So type 2 cells in the mouse do express TLR4. Uh, as, of course, macrophages express it abundantly, fibroblasts a little bit, but there, there is this innate immune ligand, and, and there's a, uh, a, a global TLR4 knockout mouse in which the uh, type 2 cells no longer express, um, express TLR4. So we ask the simple question, if you don't have this innate immune ligand, now it's not, it's not uh, type 2 cell specific, the mice die at a greater rate and they generate more fibrosis, suggesting that, that that this innate immune ligand is important to somehow prevent the extent of fibrosis that happens after bleo injury. So one of the things then we began to look at is what happens in these TLR4 knockout mice. And what we find, this is our physiology again, remember this is the repair curve here in black is normal, but it's blunted. So in the absence of TLR4, the ability of the type 2 cells to repair themselves is blunted. So why? So um, during the time that I was at Duke, um, I had the great um, opportunities to work uh, in collaboration with Bridget Hogan and, and Christina Barkaskis, who was a pulmonary fellow at the time, now is a rising faculty star. Um, and we collaborated with her on this system in which you could, you could, you could grow these little uh, lungs in a dish. You heard about this from uh, Mary Amanios earlier. Um, but basically, you take the purified type 2 cells and you plate them um, in a matrix gel with uh, fibroblasts, and Christina liked to use the PDGF receptor alpha GFP sorted cells, and they sort of try to form this little lung. Um, this is an assay that a number of groups are using now to sort of use this as a tool to assess the regenerative capacity of whatever purified cells you're putting in there and putting them together. So this, you can quantitate this. It's a tricky assay because it's in matrix gel and it, and it takes a lot of effort and, and concentration and focus to make sure you get good reliable data because it is a bioassay. So what we're looking at here is just this colony forming efficiency. So this is our wild type, consider that 100%. And what we found was in fact, when we isolated the type two cells from the TLR4 deficient mouse, it was defective. They essentially were defective in their ability to um, defective in their ability to form these colonies. Now, remember, I told you that there's this hyaluron and coat on the surface of type two cells, and so we wanted to ask the question: What would happen if we if we put that purified glycosaminoglycan back in there? So, interestingly, in the wild type situation, we could boost the colony forming efficiency, the ability to kind of grow these little lungs, these alveolospheres in the dish. But in the absence of TLR4, it didn't happen. So it suggested that, that the hyaluron and the purified HA needed this ligand, to, uh, needed this receptor to be able to form these colonies. So then we wanted to ask the question, does this have anything to do with hyaluronan? So what, uh, what we did was we made actually a conditional deletion. So this is throughout embryonic development of the major enzyme that allows the body to make hyaluronan. But we did it in, in um, SPC expressing cells. So we generated a mouse that doesn't have hyaluronan on the cell surface of type 2 cells. And this just shows that we were effective here. This is our uh, 
This is our targeted deletion, and this just shows you that you don't, you don't release the hyaluron end to the same extent into the alveolar space. So we were successful. So what happens when we challenge, we were really bummed. We waited, golly, even a year, looked at old mice. It did not, we did not spontaneously get fibrosis, which was a disappointment. But if we gave um, uh, doses, low doses of bleomycin, the mice were much, much more susceptible. You had clearly more fibrosis. So the question then was, does this have anything to do with the type 2 cell being able to uh, renew itself? So this is looking at um, the... Um, this is looking at the colony forming efficiency here. And in the absence of HAS2 on the type 2 cells, it is significantly, uh, significantly reduced. And, and basically what we did then was well, we put back in uh, the, the hyaluron end and we could in essence uh, partially restore this process. So in the absence of HAS2, the regenerative capacity was, sufficient, was, was significantly blunted, but we could sort of restore it to some extent. So what about IPF? So there's a number of groups, Tim Blackwell and I were discussing this earlier, trying to figure out how to get type 2 cells out of an explant lung. It's, it's scarred down. It's a mess. Um, but a number of groups, uh, uh, Barry Strip working with Jeff Whitson and group, published some recent work. And so this is some of the work that we've been doing, suggesting that, in fact, there are fewer uh, type 2 cells in the IPF lung compared to normal. And to do that, of course, a flow cytometric gating strategy had to be developed, and Barry Strip really championed this. Uh, he's a, he's, he's, he, he, I wasn't going to move to Los Angeles unless Barry moved as well. We were colleagues at Duke. And so looking at these EPCAM positive H, HT280, this is the Leland Dobbs um, antibody that he developed, there clearly seemed to be fewer type 2 cells. But what really was exciting to me, and quite honestly was unexpected, is when we, we can look, we can isolate these cells, we don't put them on plastic, and we can ask a simple question. Do they have their blanket? Do they have their warm coat of hyaluronan? And this is what the normal uh, lung looks like. This is what the IPF lung looks like. So there was a significant reduction in the cell surface coat. And um, this is the quantitating that. It's reduced about nearly in half. And interestingly, there seems to be um, a down regulation at the RNA level. So expression of the, uh, the RNA for the enzyme to be expressed was diminished. So what does this mean? So we then wanted to look at the IPF fibroblast, taking these guys out, using this uh, in vitro alveolar sphere, colony forming, trying to grow along in a dish. And what we learned was that, in fact, they do it really poorly. So you saw the beautiful data when Mary Ormanios showed that she targeted the telomerase pathway in type 2 cells. And you, you saw that those cells didn't express colonies very well at all. But that's what we're seeing in IPF now, is that the ability to form the colonies is impaired. So the question I have is if we can figure out how to restore this function, regardless of which of the genetic mutations get there, is this kind of, if you will, the holy grail? Can we, can we show that if we do this in vitro, would that translate um, into restoring the ability of the alveolar epithelium in vivo in patients? That's the holy grail for that. So one of the things we're also interested in, so if you look at normal, because the issue is what about different regions of the lung? It's a patchy disease. Maybe we're seeing this just because we're isolating cells from the more fibrotic or the less fibrotic. So this is in normal. So, so about 80% of the cells, the type 2 cells, have their, have their covering blanket and they're happy. But interestingly, about 20% don't. And that is a kind of reversed, if you will, in IPF. But what's interesting, even in the normal type 2 cell, if you don't have hyaluronan on the cell surface, you're deficient uh, in your ability to form these colonies, suggesting that this might be part of a homeostatic mechanism for proper renewal. And then, of course, what we wanted to know is could we restore this in vitro? And we have, we have to give a lot more than we gave in the mouse type 2 cells that were deficient in HAS2. But we could partially augment the ability of these human type 2 cells to try to form this lung. 
and so one of the other things I, I, I did mention, we wanted to look at different areas of the lung, and it didn't matter whether or not it was a less severe or a more severe, we saw the same diminution in the um, cell surface HA, suggesting that this might be a component uh, of the phenotype that leads to the impaired type 2 cell uh, renewal abilities in IPF. So this was an editorial, and in addition, just in, in, in interest of time, I left this piece out, but because one of the questions is, if we can do this in vitro, can we translate it into in vivo? And in the mouse, we could. So the other, we did a, we searched for, for um, genes that were not expressed, either in the absence of TLR4 or the absence of HAS2. And one of them that came up was IL-6. IL-6 is really potent in gut stem cell renewal. So what we showed in the paper was that if we block the ability to make IL-6 or we put it back in, we could in fact improve the outcomes of survival and fibrosis, suggesting in the mouse that if you can find substances that, that really restore that colony forming ability, could that translate uh, into improved outcomes in pulmonary fibrosis? So in summary, um, this innate immune receptor and this glycosaminoglycan that's in every part of the body. In the lung, the reason we, we like this idea is because what, what HA looks like, so the cell wall of the streptococcus is, is made up of hyaluronan. And the LPS, not the lipid A moiety, but the polysaccharide side chain is very similar. So our thinking is because the, the lung is exposed to the air. And in the gut, commensal bugs are, are protective against injury. They interact with the key epithelial cells in the gut to be able to promote repair. But in the alveolar space, you can argue about whether there's bugs or not, but I don't think any of us would disagree that the alveolar space is different than the gut. If it's not, we, you're, you're on a ventilator, unfortunately. So basically, the thinking is that this molecule evolved to sort of function like a commensal bacteria to help protect the lung in, under normal homeostatic renewal, but also after injury. And the loss of this enzyme in type 2 cells results in impaired regenerative capacity in the mouse exacerbated fibrosis. So the question, and one of the things we're interested in is trying to use this as a model system to find drugs that might augment this process. But even though I've spent a lot of time killing mice over the last two decades, I do fundamentally believe that the key, the cure, we really want to focus on a cure for IPF. We have drugs that clearly are effective in slowing the process, but to get a cure, I think we really have to focus, um, you know, on, on the patients and the materials that we can, can get, particularly at the time of lung transplant. So I will stop there. This, uh, this is the, a schematic of the Advanced Health Sciences Pavilion uh, at Cedar sinai Medical uh, Center. The Lung Institute is, uh, is on the top floor right next to the Barbara Streisand Heart Center. Pisses me off. But these are the, these are the folks um, that, that I've had the great pleasure of working with. And let's go get a drink, huh? <laughs>